finally tonight, one man's journey into his own personal history and into the roots and history of American cooking and cuisine from Africa to today. Jeffrey Brown is back for this visit with the author. It's part of our series, Race Matters. Cinnamon squash, black eyed peas, okra, uh, watermelon, peanuts, beans. For chef Michael Twitty, farm to table has a deeper meaning than for most. Twitty is a culinary historian who explores the complicated story of race, culture, and food. And he's now the first revolutionary in residence at Colonial Williamsburg, where visitors come to learn about and experience life in 18th century Virginia. Twitty takes part in the town's historic recreations, wearing the clothing of the enslaved people who once toiled here. This is the kind of garden that an enslaved person would have. Imagine this is not in a a big period garden space. Yeah. Imagine that this is a space where this is behind your cabin or beside your this cabin. This is your little plot. This is your little plot in one place. And it's, you know, designed to be as fertile and as self-sustaining as possible. If you're working in a tobacco field, sun to sun, the only time you can cultivate this garden is early dawn, twilight, and at night. The other thing that's noticeable here, of course, is these aren't like nice, neat rows. No, 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 no. Our ancestors would have won every single environmental award. I mean, they were organic, they were local, they were sustainable, uh, they practiced permaculture, they composted. Those are all modern labels, but they're already doing that here. It's an issue of people who are in exile adapting, adapting to where they are and figuring out how to make it work. Ancestry is a central theme in Twitty's new book, The Cooking Gene, a journey through African-American culinary history in the Old South. He addresses what he calls discomfort food in the legacy of the South, in part with visits to tobacco and cotton fields previously tended by the enslaved. At Williamsburg, he joined Ed Schultz in a display field. You know, as soon as cotton gin comes up, right. this domestic slave trade comes right. into play after and that. Right, and that encourages slavery elsewhere. Right. And it keeps going. Right. Keeps going, keeps going. The Old South, comprising slaveholding states, takes central stage in Twitty's book, which weaves explorations of his own identity, including his conversion to Judaism, the roots of American food, and stories from his own childhood. The book you chose to write is also part memoir, right? Yeah. So why use your own story and your own family and to tell that story? I was always um, intrigued by this notion of the black autobiography. I mean, the kind of writing that, you know, my Angelo or James Baldwin did. Mm -hmm. You know, how I got over. Yeah. Um, how I um, came to be this person that we have passions that last our whole lives and that we are extremely engaged in our own history and culture. Yeah, um, but you didn't start out that way, no, even by your own right, description, own right? Description. I didn't, I didn't, wasn't interested in soul food. I, was, I didn't even really like being black, I think right. you wrote. Right? Exactly. So I why suddenly like, explore all that? I wanted to re-approach the sort of narrative of self-critique and self-hatred but also letting people know that the food was my way in. Um, the stories, I got a sense of pride of the people who I came from, my own family. And I felt like I wanted to put the microscope on myself. And I wanted other people to not be afraid to, to also follow the blueprint and sort of really own every aspect of their identity. Twitty, now 40, has delved deeply into his background, undergoing DNA testing and building an extensive family tree of ancestors from many parts of the world, including West Africa and Northern Europe. You also got some surprises, though, I think, right? Yes. I mean, like a, a Confederate captain? My great-great-great-grandfather, Richard Henry Bellamy, was a captain of the Confederate Army. And when you do genealogy as an African-American and you get your DNA results, you're gonna find tons of white folks that you're related to. We are, we are connected the same way that those stories passed down from my grandmother said we were. Many of those stories were passed down to Twitty in the kitchens of his childhood around Washington, D.C. At Williamsburg, Twitty often works with fellow chef Harold Caldwell in this 18th century kitchen to bring history to life for visitors. 
Here, as in colonial times, the cooking fire burns even on the hottest days of summer. So who are you thinking of as you're cooking? My aunties. Right. You know, my great aunties. That's it. Um, Granddaddies at barbecue. Right, that's right, that's right. All the men who are in the kitchen, all my uncles cook. But when people just label them just slaves, yeah, they put them in a class like they like they don't have a soul, like they're not human beings. Do you know the names of the of anybody we who do. cooked here? We know there was 28 enslaved people. We know every name of every enslaved person that was on this property because of the inventory that they had. Yeah. yeah so we speak their name as, as much as as much as we as often as possible. We like to think of these folks as the founders of American cuisine. You know, in their hands, no. European, Native, African, Asian foodways get combined and recombined. An amalgam of cultures is the quintessential American story, but when addressing American food, Twitty says certain people have been left out of the narrative. A lot of people are the argument, well, what is American food? And for some people, they'll blurt out fast food. For some people, they'll blurt out, it's food from all over the world. Um, and then very rarely, it's someone will talk about the indigenous as well as the naturalized foods and traditions. And so I want people to sort of include us in that conversation. And know that we've always been a part of it. We've always been a part of the narrative of creating American food, and always will be. Yeah, we, that's also part of the agency factor, that you own your emotions, you own your facts, you own your opinions, and you also understand how we got here and how you got here. And we can have that conversation over a meal. And that's what I, what I really want to do. I mean, um, I'm this weird guy. I am this gay, Jewish, African-American, Southern food writer who, you know, rubs elbows with genealogists and living historians and reenactors and museum professionals and teachers and academics. And, and I want to sit all those people down at the same table to feast on the idea that we are different, but we're very much the same. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Jeffrey Brown in Colonial Williamsburg, Virginia. It's all fascinating. Culinary historian Michael Twitty shares a recipe and the story behind it on our website. You can learn how to make sorghum brine chicken roasted in cabbage leaves.